welcome to a game of hierarchies where we use the next hour or so to talk about advanced algorithms in advanced graph algorithms in T-SQL. My name is Markus Ehrenmüller Jensen and if you have any questions after this talk, please follow me on Twitter or um, add me on LinkedIn. As you can see, I'm quite active in the community. But do you know what Tyrion Lannister would think about the speaker's light? He would say every fool loves to hear that he's important. And this leads me to the question, who of you is actually into uh, Game of Thrones? Who of you did read the books or did uh, watch TV series? Would be happy if you could add in the chat window either TV or book, because I'm curious um, what you think about, if, if you have seen the TV series or read the books. In case you are about the books and uh, know something about the books and TV series, the next question is for you. So if, if somebody says, Bala Morgulis, which is in English, it's all men must die, and it's like a creating formula in, in Old Valyrian, what is the correct answer? What would you answer if somebody says Vala Magulis? Also, paste this into the uh, chat window. I'm really curious what you think about that. By the way, I will be able to answer your questions while I'm talking because this is a pre-recorded session for Data Platform Summit 2020. So I recorded this session a couple of weeks ago and now I'm watching it live together with you and I will answer any questions you might have. There's also space for or time for Q&A at the end of this talk. So the right answer would be Balato Harris, all men must serve. By the way, if you've never seen the books, uh, never seen the TV show or did read the books, I will not spoil anything. So everything I use here in this uh, examples is based on the first book and the first couple of chapters. So there's plenty of opportunities that you still read the books. I've, Gathered some, um, collect some of the important links if you're interested in the books or if you want to hear more about the TV show. I really recommend both of them. It was really fun to read the books and watch the TV show. The demo examples I created on my own. So I created one example about point of interests, which are then grouped by region, continent, and worlds with routes in between. There's also a small recipe database. I think there's only two or three recipes in there and it's not very big. And I don't think we will see anything about that today. And there's also the family tree. So I put in parts of the Stark family down uh, to the current uh, Stark family, uh, Edward Stark and his children and the female and the male ancestors. If you want to play around with this data set, feel free to uh, go to a game of hierarchies.wordpress.com and there's a description how you can install those samples on your own database. For today, I brought three episodes. One is about self-joining tables. This can be some uh, somehow complicated because if you want to join successfully join self-joining tables, we have to either write loops in T-SQL or use commentary expressions, recursive commentary expressions. That sounds a little bit dangerous. Then we will do a little excursion into Cypher query language, which is new, which is new in SQL Server since uh, SQL Server 2017. And then we will play around with graphs. So typical things are transitive closure or shortest path, and we will see many more things as long as we have time for that. So let's start with querying uh, via loops. So if we want to loop or find out about our descendants, then first we have to find out what is the root node, where do we want to begin our looping. And in a function, I would insert the first row in a temp table. And then I would fetch the children of this root table, uh, of this root node, and insert them as well in the temp table. And then we start looping over the point two, unless, so then we fetch the children of the children of the uh, first node, and then their children, and then their children, until we do not get any rows returned. Then we, this would be our um, break condition for our loop. 
There are limits in recursion. For example, if you want to write functions and use them uh, recursive, so that one function calls itself again and again, then there's a limit of 32 levels. So if you want to implement something um, as a recursive function, you have to be sure that you do not have more than 32 levels. And uh, other, if, if you have more than those levels, then it will break with an error message. For loops, there's an endless, there's no limit. We can endlessly loop, um, but be careful. Of course, there's limits like memory and disk space. If you insert something into a temp table, of course, the size of the temp table will grow. So there's somehow always a, a physical limitation, but there's no logical limitation by T-SQL. And for commutative expression, that's the same. So we can have endless loops in commutative expression. So time for the first thing. Up, up. Uh, we shall um, um, management studio and I always have to make sure that I run in the right database and then we can see what I prepared here. So the first table I want to introduce is the family table. So the family table consists of uh, rules for the Stark family. Something in my eye. And as we can see here, I have an ID, I have your first name, we have the father ID and the row with number 116. What happened there? I tried to zoom in there. Let's do it again. Not working, zoom it is not working. So the row with ID 116 is Edward Stark and his father is number 114. That's what we get from this table. And if you want to see uh, the children of Edward Stark, then we can query the father ID with 116. Please be aware, I only use those IDs for educational purposes. You should never query logical things by IDs because IDs can change, but I want to make this simple from a syntax perspective, that's why I use the ID here. So if I want to see the children of Edward Stark, I query all the rows where the father ID is 116. So then I get all the rows where uh, Edward Stark is the father. And this is Rob, Sansa, Arya, Brandon, Rickon, and little John. Ah, uh, little Rickon and of course, John. John Snow, the bastard. If I want to include the father, then we could, for example, use a union all. So I'm union both queries, one with the father and the other one with the children. And then I can like make this like look like a tree by having this pipe symbol there. So now we get all the rows, both Edward and his children. So if you want to build a whole tree of the family Stark, then we could of course union, union, union all the levels, but it's not very smart because of course the children of Edward Stark will sooner or later also have children. And every time we have new children, a new level of this sentence, then we have to change our queries. And this is not very smart that we have to change the code if something happens in the data. So the more smart way would go to, um, a loop, for example. So the first example we are seeing here is I'm creating a function calling called dbod sentence, and this uh, gets an ID for the root node, for example, 116 for Edward Stark, and returns a table uh, which consists of the ID, the level, so I know on which level uh, the descendant is, and the nice thing with um, functions is that we for those uh, temporary tables, for this table variables, I'm using as a return value here, I can define a primary key and I can define a unique clustered, a, um, a key, unique clustered uh, index, which helps me performance-wise if uh, I return many rows. 
and then we're going through those levels. So first thing is that I'm initiating the father level with zero. So I start with zero and insert the ID I got as a parameter and the father level, which is zero to my descendants table. That's the first, the first thing we're doing. We're inserting the root node or root nodes. And then I go into a loop. And as long as something is returned from this uh, select statement, insert statement, or the one inside of the while loop, I am increasing the father level by one and then inserting not fixed values, but everything which is from the descendants joined to the family where the child's father ID. So this one father ID is the ID of the descendants table. So here I get the next level of the children and I will make sure that I query from the descendants table, I query those with father level above, so one level above. So first we had uh, inserted this with level zero, I incre increased this by one, so now father level is one, but I want to have all the children uh, where the father level, where the father's father level was one minus one, zero. And this is what I'm looping over. As long as something is returned from this, I will get the rows. And as we can see, if we execute this, so let's find the start here and let's create the function. Then we can use this in our uh, select, um, select statement from DBO descendants. That's the name of the function. I, ins um, I call it with 100. 100 is the first Stark I inserted into my table. It's just pension, pension Stark. Um, and then join this with the family. So I get also the other information, not only the ID, but also the first name and the father ID. So what did I do here? I marked the wrong line here, invalid object, because I always forget to change to the right table. So let's execute this again. And then we get the the uh, Stark family starting with pension, uh, which has, of course, pension has a father, but I don't know the father, so I didn't insert it into the table. So there's always like one, at least one node where we do not have more information about their father or about their boss, about whatever our hierarchy is about. And this is father level zero. And then I inserted all the rows which are children of pension. So this is obviously Ricken and Cregan and so on, and down to Edward, which is on level eight, and then Edward's children on father level nine here. Because of a little bit format this output, so I replicate a blank and a pipe symbol and a blank as many uh, levels I have I have. And in this way, oh, again, I marked the wrong lines here. Sorry for that. So we get like this intention and now I have like more look. This is like hierarchical data, but this is only formatting. We can also query like uh, having the youngest generation. So how can we do that? How can we find about the leaf level? So like the trees, uh, start with the node and then we have the leaf levels at the bottom. So the trees in IT always uh, bottom bottom up. So the trees level would be uh, some, with all those rows where I do not find their ID as a father ID. So where not exists a row where the ID of this row is a father ID. So those do not have any children and by definition, those are the leaf levels. So as easy as that, we can that then we get Rob, Sansa, Arya, Brandon, Rickon, and again, John Snow. For optimization, we can also ins, um, introduce a max levels. So where I stop the loop, not when I do not find anything, but if I reach the maximum amount of levels. And so the only difference here is that my while condition is not only on the row count, but also on the father level has to be lower than the max levels or max levels is null. So if I don't do not pass any max levels, I get all of the levels. That's the only difference here for this function. And if we execute this and the select statement down there where I again ask for 100 and null, so that I return the same like we have already seen. And we can use this max level, for example, to only get two generations of Starks. 
So I start with 114, two levels, that would be the father of Edward Stark, which is Rickard Stark. We would get Edward Stark on the level one, and then again we get the children of Edward as we ask for two levels of father. And with this trick we can also ask for only the great grandchildren. So if I ask for max levels of two and ask for descendants only with father level two, that means I, I only get the grandchildren of Rickard Stark with ID 114. We can also um, query the tree the other way around. So starting with one, um, one level and going up in the tree to the ancestors. This is what I'm doing here. So um, again, I start with father level zero, which, which would be like the lowest level. And then we are adding up um, the levels as, um, as we add up uh, more ancestors. And for this, I insert into the ancestor table, which is the return table, ID and father level. And I add the ID and the father level. So the ID would be first the ID I get from, um, from, uh, from the parameter. And then I always change the ID to whatever is the father of the current ID. So that's, that's the way I am going up those levels in my tree. Executing this starting with 116 would mean that we start with Edward Stark and on level zero and then I go up the tree and find my ancestors. And of course we also can like limit with max level to only see certain levels. So only the father and grandfather of Edward Stark by adding parameter two. So this is now limited to father level two or only showing the grandfather by adding parameter two as a max level and also limiting the levels to the level two, which is of course by definition, the grandfather, two levels above Edward. That's what we get here. An interesting uh, thing is the path uh, in the hierarchy. So in the hierarchy there's always one one direct weight from one node to the other, to the other nodes. And the path shows the way from the top node, from the top level, from the root, to every single part in, in this, uh, in this uh, hierarchy. And this is done by starting the path just as a dot, for example, the dot and then the ID. So I convert the ID here in the varchar and having a dot uh, in front and um, after, so I, I do not exchange number uh, 110 and uh, 0, 011 or something like that. So that's why I'm introducing limiters there. And for every level, I um, uh, concatenate to the existing father path, to the path of the father. I concatenate again the current ID of the child plus a dot. So let's have a look how this looks in our query result. So with this, uh, again, one root much. So what we get here is that we start with the father path dot 101 uh, dot is the ID and the father path for the next level is the father's path, which is dot 100 dot and 102 because uh, this is the ID 102 and we can again go down to the lowest level then we see the whole path how those nodes are connected with each other in our um, hierarchy. This is called materials path and we can use this for um, to query. We can also introduce uh, sorting. So I add another sort criteria here as a bar binary and the sort criteria is the is also based on um, is based on um, the first name. So currently we we cannot query um, order by. So let's let's take a look here. So so this is a row number um, which is 
started again and again every time the father ID changes. So this is uh, started by the first child is always number one and we order this by first name. It could also be any other attribute we have available in our hierarchy. But this way I started, um, started by for every father ID and then order it by first name. So we can then order the children by first name, not only by ID. So we're using the ID for the path, but we can sort it by the sort ID and the sort ID is based on the first name. So this way, if we sort after this, we can guarantee that the children, we have the children here, it's now starting with Arya, Brandon, John, Rickon, and Rob and Sansa. Because we use the first name, we could also have used the birth date or whatever, if this would be available in my database. And the sort criteria is the row number for each level. So this is why this is increasing for each, we're starting with the root, only one uh, row number there and so on and so forth. And only for the last few rows, we have different row numbers there because only for the last rows we have leave levels. And this is not the fault of the hierarchy, but this is the fault because I didn't add any other rows in my database. So I only have one son of Benjamin. Of course, Benjamin had ma many sons and many daughters, but I only entered Recon in my database here. Back to slides. If you do not want to use T-SQL or if you cannot use T-SQL because you're working with a different database, you can reach out to common table expressions, which is a standard functionality by, of SQL, not of uh, T-SQL. And the trick is similar. And what we need the common table expression to do is to have recursion. And how can we ask the common table expression to do recursion? Uh, we have to reference the name of the common table ex expression inside the definition of the common table expression. Like for functions, you would like define a function and call the function with the, the same function within the definition of the function. And the same is true for common table expression. So inside of the common table expression, we have an, um, a reference to the common table expression itself. And we always need at least two queries, one query for the root node, then a union all, and then the recursive part. The recursive part stops as, uh, as soon as the second part of the query, which refer, uh, refer, refers the common table expression, does not return any uh, other row. And use cases are plenty. For example, you could do recursive calculations, which I in real life never did. I only do this for like training classes where I explain the recursions um, in common table expression. And we, here we will use it for the self-joining hierarchies over the Stark family. Um, Couple of years ago, I found a blog post um, stating that like there's a maximum number of recursions and this is a limit in the common table expression, which did not allow for commenting. And this is really bad because it was wrong. In common table expressions, of course, there's max recursion, which we can set between one and 32, uh, seven, six, uh, seven, but we can also set it to zero and zero means there's no technical limit in the common table expression. Um, as you can do as many recursions as many your machine and your time um, allows you to do. So I will not replicate the same thing like we did with uh, the loops. You can implement it, of course, the same thing also with common table expression. But this time I want to, uh, to build a family tree like that. So we start with Rob, the young wolf, which is the eldest son of Edward Stark. And we have then his father above the child above Rob and his mother, Kathleen, below her. And then again, the father of Edward Stark, which is Rika Stark, is above Edward and the mother is below. Um, this is not my invention. This is how family trees, rural family trees are done. So we always have the father first and then the mother first. But of course, you can uh, change your definition and have the mothers, for example, first, if you want to. Let's see how this can be done. So make sure that I'm on the right database. So in this case, we start with 118, which is Robert Stark. Again, 
usually you would query like, like uh, after the business uh, key or something else and never the, the ID itself. And then we have this commentary expression with two parts. The first part is querying uh, the attributes we need from the ID, which is 118, that's the root node. So we start with Robert Stark, uh, and then we have union all, and the second part, and the second part you can see here from ancestors, and ancestors is not a table in my um, um, in my schema, but this is the common type expression itself. So I'm querying the ancestors, which is in the first round, of course it's Rob Stark, and I'm querying everything uh, which is the father of uh, Edward Stark. Uh, uh, Robert Stark. So Robert Stark is 118, I'm acquiring his father ID which will be 116 and then I get the father of Robert Stark and so I'm going up the ancestors tree. Okay, execute this and then we see we come up from Robert upwards to Benjamin, the whole the whole tree. We can do the same for the mothers. So my database also consists not only of a father ID, but also of a mother ID. And this way we get everything on the female side in the family tree. This is quite shorter. Again, this is not because somebody didn't have a mother. Of course, everybody has a mother, but my database is only filled with Kathleen and Minister and then stops there. And then there's a cool trick I learned from uh, Steve uh, that with the root, you can also, of course, have your union all, but you can have two union alls. So what I'm doing here is that I have a union all on the father's side, like we just have seen, and simultaneously on the mother's side. And this is how I get the mother's side and the father's side in one single query. So now we have everything at hand from Benjamin and Lisa on top down to Edward, Kathleen and we can see Rob on this list. The rest is only formatting then. So I'm adding the path and like we, we did previously, adding the father and on the mother side, the path. And the next step would be to add the sword because we want to have Rob in the middle and always the father on top and the mother below. This is done that I assign two as the sword number or sword string number, um, yeah, two to the sword string of Robert Stark and always one to the sword string of the fathers and three to the mothers. This is how I get like the fathers first and the mothers afterwards. And in case of planks, so if there's uh, for the first levels, I guarantee that they're just in between by adding a fixed string of uh, 222. So if we are looking at how this works, we can execute this here and then we can see that there's like the father path Make this a little bit bigger. And there's a sword. So this way Rob is in the middle and his father is just uh, above him and his mother is below him. And his mother's father is again above Kathleen. This is done through the two, three and ones I add in my sword criteria. And that's how we end up um, with the right query. If we tweak a little bit about the full name and the layout, we get exactly what I was looking for. A tree built on the Stark family, starting with Rob in the middle and having everybody, the fathers above and the mothers below. If you have any question, please ask them. So, Cypher Query Language, which is quite interesting. This is an add-on in uh, since version 2017. And for the Cypher Query Language, this is ASCII-based. So, if you think about uh, graphs, we always have nodes like the father uh, and the child. So be two nodes in a person table or the family table and there are edges in between like is father off. And as you can see, this is, there's an arrow. There's an arrow. And as you can see, there's an arrow between the father and the child and this is directed. So only the father is the father of the child, but that the child is not the father of the father. 
And if you would transfer this to ASCII, this could look like that. So we have the father node on one side, the child node on the other one. Then we have a dash on one side and a dash and the creator sample on the other side, which is the, uh, mimicking the arrow going from the father to the child. And then the parentheses, we have the is father of, which is the name of the edge. And this is exactly how we write queries in Suffolk Gray language. Let's open up the demo. And I think I'm on the wrong database here. Something tells me I have to change the connection to, no, I'm right here. Very good. But I have to change to my right database. So what I've got here is three tables. One is the family table as a graph table. And the family table consists of, I see this is a node. So as we can see here, um, with node ID, and this is a node, this is a JSON document telling me this is the DBO table, DBO family table, and we have different IDs there, and then we have the attributes. Down there, we have the is mother, which is an edge, as we can see here, this is an edge table. Above, we had the node table, and the edge table is called DBO is mother, and it's connecting one node, like some ID with another node. So we have the from ID, this is a node ID, and also the to ID is also a node, node ID, and this is connecting those nodes. This is like a relation, uh, like uh, if you have many to many relationships, then you have a bridge table in between. Edge table is almost the same. And you can write Suffolk query. So what I'm looking for is I'm using, um, I'm looking for the first name and the first name of the child and the first name of the father. Um, the from is written in pre ANSI 93 uh, logic, so we don't have any joins. If you use Suffolk query language, we have no joins, but we have the match clause. In the match clause, here we have the Suffolk query. Uh, so if the father is one of the nodes, child is the other node table, in between is the is father, which is the edge table, and I'm looking for every uh, for rows where uh, the father is, or yeah, some family node. Uh, in the, which I named father is referring or is father of another entry in the same family table, which I addressed with child. And this really works. If you've never seen Suffolk query language, this is an interesting uh, way of writing queries. This works also in the other direction. So I can like change the direction by pointing to the other direction. This is no, no problem at all. And I can also like uh, limit this. So if I'm interested in the uh, children of Edward, of course I can add more filters in my work class. If I do this, I only get the children of Edward, uh, which are the fam familiars, Rob, Sansa, Aria, Brandon, Rickon, and Jon Snow. If you want to have the grandfather and the father and the child, then we can have more tables. I'm referring to family table once as the child, once as the father, and once as the grandfather. And in between is always the bridge, uh, the, not the bridge table, but the edge table is father, uh, as is father or is grandfather. And then I match for where grandfather is the grandfather of father, who is again the father of child. So I only get uh, like, there's at least three levels available of, of, of nodes. Let's execute this. So I get Cregan, Cregan, Banshan, or down there we have Kathleen, Hoster, and then we don't know the grandfather. We can also find couples. So for example, I can search for where the father is the same for one child and the other child, one child and the second child. Um, I add additional conditions to avoid that I get the same child because of course the father like, um, um, Rob would be then found because Rob, uh, Rob and Rob shares the same father because it's the same person. I do not want to have the same person twice. And, uh, of course, Rob is the father and, um, Rob is, is the child of, of, of Edward and Sansa is the child of, of Edward and also, uh, like Sansa is the child and Rob is the child. So to avoid those couples, I choose to only see one. So I'm, yeah, always eliminating, uh, eliminating one of those couples. Uh, and I don't really care which of those couples. So I eliminating, uh, eliminating, eliminating them by first name. So this is 
what we then get, we have Ethered in the middle, and then we have all the chi uh, children. So Aria combined with all the others, then we have Brandon with everybody combined ex except Aria, then we have John combined with everybody except Brandon and Aria, Rickon and uh, Rob and Sansa at the very end. An interesting thing in graphs is transitive closure. Not so much for hierarchies, but for real graphs, which are not hierarchies. So transitive closure means how can I find a way from one node in my graph to another node in this graph? And usually I want to count how many nodes and edges are be in between, because this tells me something about the distance. The edges can have attributes, so I then don't, do not only count the number of edges, but I would sum up like the attributes, like the miles or the costs or uh, the time it takes to got, get from one node to the other. If you think about GPS systems, then exactly thinking of the right examples here. And yeah, the length of the path could be, if it's an unweighted graph, it would be an amount of nodes, uh, or we could add up those attributes if, they're, if they are available. So let's see what there is for us with transitive closure. Again, go to that database, and then I implemented this transitive closure with a common table expression. And I did my best. I'm convinced that this works in theory, but uh, practically I had to uh, stop it after 60 minutes. I let this run for one hour and it did never end. The tricky part with non hierarchical graphs, like real graphs, is that there's always the danger of a loop. So I can go from one city to the other city and then co co could go back again. And if I am querying those uh, graphs, I always have to make sure that I never go back in the path because then I would end up with an endless loop. And the only way I could come up with was that I'm checking uh, with a like expression that the path I'm currently at uh, I'm, the path I'm currently at, this is this one, so the B node where I'm looking to is not part of the path I already did. And this little guy makes this commentary expression really, really, really slow, at least for my 187 nodes I have in my table here. So this does not really work. This is only a theoretical output. Um, so I reached out for a function again. So transitive closure, returns uh, or gets the starting point of interest, so the ID of the city or the name of the city in this case, and then it returns all the other nodes, the IDs and the node ID and the level uh, of the of the nodes um, and how how long it is. So the level is how long it takes from, from the current node I'm asked for to the, uh, to the other nodes. And this is done again, I start with level zero I insert then the information I already got from the parameters, and then I have my while loop, very similar to what we already have seen. I increase uh, the level, and then I always look for um, things in, in the table I already got, limited to the previous level, and uh, also um, make sure that I do not cycle. So I only want to have something which does not exist already in the transitive closure. So the node ID I'm looking at is, is not allowed to be part of my current um, transitive closure table. And if you execute this, so we start for example with King's Landing, I can pass in the name here, not the ID, and join the point of interest. If you execute this, then we get a long list of our points of interest with node ID and the level would be the distance. So the edge mark, I can go over two other nodes to Estabor, it takes eight uh, edges in between. So this, this is longer away uh, in certain times of cities I'm passing through, or points of interest I'm passing through. We can also add different attributes and uh, the path. So if I add the miles, and if I add the path, I have more information at hand. So the miles is only the sum of the miles I already got in my table. So I add up the miles in the path 
I already executed and add the miles for the new node I found. And the path is the same thing uh, as we already have seen with the Stark family, like going from Edward to Rob, um, we can also do the same for the points of interest. Let's execute this and then query it there. So again, we start with King's Landing and then we get not only the number of nodes, but we also get the miles in between. So Ashmark was two levels away, two hops, and it takes 1,000 1, miles and the edges in between was I have to go from King's Landing to Castle Rock to Ashmark. So we have two edges in between, that's why we have the level two here. So Estabor, um, my algorithms found more than one solution. So we can go over Tirish, uh, from Tirish to Mur or Lis, and there's also another possibility, and we have different miles. So obviously, in many times, we would choose the shortest path, which will be the next uh, thing we will find out about. No, oh, shortest path. So how can we optimize the path we found in our queries? There's basically different ways of algorithms. The easiest to understand and the easiest and fastest to implement uh, probably is the breadth first. Breadth first means that I go from one level to the next level to the next level. So I'm not looking down to, to the leave level and then to the next leave level and find out what is the, uh, the, the shortest path, but I'm going from one level to the other one. The Dijkstra is a little bit different. It's not going level by level, but taking one node and always going the shortest way uh, to, to the next load. So it's, it's like, like looking for the neighbor nodes and then always choosing the, the, the one which has the shortest distance. And from there, it looks again around. Um, this is better in some, some cases uh, because it can also uh, account for weighted graphs. So if I want to optimize for the miles, uh, this is possible with Dijkstra. Yeah, already explained that we're going from one level to the other level, like the algorithms we already have seen. So all the functions you already have seen, the commutator expression, this was an implementation of a breadth first implementation. Oh, let me make sure I have to write database there. And for the transitive closure, I would just use the latest function I had, where I calculate everything, and then I could run um, at a King's Landing, um, uh, call the transitive closure, for example, for King's Landing, and then looking for the first value ordered by the levels. So this would be an unweighted um, algorithm looking for the shortest path in an unweighted manner, meaning I'm looking for a solution where I do not jump too many, too many times, too many nodes in between. And we can compare this. So uh, for if you have 2016, uh, SQL Server 2016 in place or older, that's the way you can implement this. If you have 2017 or newer, uh, no, 2019, so shortest path, uh, was an extension to the GraphDB in SQL Server 2019. And of course, it's also available in Azure SQL DB. We have this new keyword shortest path. It's so new that uh, SQL Server Management Studio doesn't recognize it. it. We get this red squiggle line here. And for this, I can look for a path from A to B over my route table with an, I don't care how many hops, but find the shortest, shortest path here. And if we execute the whole query here, and I should have turned on the execution. I'm doing here. So if we turn on the execution plan, then we can see that the uh, solution with a SQL Server Craft API is nice, but it takes uh, like the cost for the execution of this is almost double as, uh, more than double uh, as the solution with uh, the um, implemented manually we, we had a few. So there's still some some things um, we have to, oh, everybody has to find out about the, the GraphDB, where to use it and where not to use it. But 
From a syntax perspective, it's much easier to write because I do not need a function. I do not have to maintain a function. Um, even, for example, if I do not have the right to create a function, then uh, yeah, I could write, a, of course, a TCP loop. Um, but um, like understanding and writing this in SQL 19 with the graph TP is easier to understand, but the performance might suffer. For the Dexter implementation, um, we're not going uh, from one level to the other, but as I already explained, we fetch one node and then we fetch neighbor nodes from the starting point, the shortest one. And we're also always accounting for the whole distance. So for example, it could be that there's like um, it's shorter going from A to B than from A to C, but we want to arrive in D and going over B is longer because like the hop, the first hop is, is rather short, but the next hop is rather long and it could be like the other way around uh, with the other round and Dexter would, would find that for us. So Dexter, we need a list of all the nodes and initiated um, them that the cumulative, uh, this, the cumulated distance to, from my starting point to the, uh, to, the, to the other nodes is like really, really, really high. So I initiated to with the highest number I can have as an in, in an integer and then I mark them, I've never been there. And then I start with the starting node and mark it with distance zero, because of course, from my starting point to my starting point, there's no distance. Um, and then I process the node. So I go to the next node, which is shorter, which is the shortest one, um, and account for the distance there and mark this one that I have already processed. This is very important so we do not get into loops. And then I update the list um, all of uh, from all my, my uh, nodes, if I've been there, if I processed it or not, and what the real distance is. And then I repeat. And then we query this list. Um, and this looks like you can see in the following example. Again, game of hierarchies. So Dexter, this is what I learned or took from Hansa, hansolaf.net. Um, this page is still out there and this was implementation as a procedure. Um, I reworked it so it works with my demo database. As I prefer functions, because I think that they were more flexible, I rewrote everything as a function. So it's your choice if you want to use the function or the, the procedure. So the function, uh, again, shortest path in Dijkstra, we have um, the start and the end point. So I want to give, go from A to B start and end ID and this function returns then the ID, the point of interest, the cumulative distance and the shortest path and the shortest path with the names. So then I initiated, uh, I find or define what's the maximum distance I could have and uh, with this little formula, I get the highest number I can get in an integer. So two, two billion is what we can store in an integer. I declare a shortest path table where I insert all the nodes. As we can see here, I insert all the nodes. And for the starting reason, I see this is the maximum distance I could go there. And the done, so to do I have processed this is zero. So I didn't, I didn't process it uh, right now. And then I'm looking for the shortest path. Shortest path, um, I set the community sentence to zero for the starting node. As I said, going from one position to itself, this is like zero distance. And then I loop everything. So I um, don't know where to go, find out where to go. Uh, this is the ID of a node I find where the cumulative distance is lower than the maximum distance and which is not yet um, processed. And then I find out if I could not find anything because there is no, no, no more nodes or I'm already at the, start, at the end, then I break my loop. If not, I updated, uh, update my shortest path and set everything to done where the from ID, which I found out in the previous uh, query, um, the ID is exactly the, the from ID. And then again, I update the shortest path and set the cumulative distance and the previous ID for the previous node. So I know that I came from there and up, um, uh, adding up the, the cumulative distances. So I know how many miles are from one node to the other node. 
and this is how I find my way in my um, in my um, graph. So I lose, use the match class in here from A to B over the route, uh, where the the, uh, the destination is the from ID, uh, and the the done is not yeah, and I did not already process it. So let's go there and execute the function with some samples. So I call it with one, I think one is King's Landing and no distance. So I get a list of all the distances, 55, I can't remember. Ah, no, one is Winterfell, 55 is King's Landing. I should, um, I should read my own comments. It's very, really helpful here. Then I calculate the distance between uh, King's Landing and Winterfell and King's Landing or uh, King's Landing and Bravos and King's Landing and Cohort. So let's execute this. So we're re redefining this function. And then we can see, for example, that the cumulative distance is so many, so, so many miles. I can see the path. In this case, I have the path as over the IDs and down there also over the, uh, over the names. So you can see I can go direct, directly from Winterfell to Castle Serving. It's only, there's no other node in between. It's only 100 miles, mod Kaelin. I can walk uh, or go from Winterfell over Castle uh, Serin and then um, arrive in mod Kaelin. This can also be done for the other cities as well. Or if I'm really interested in just one example, going from one city to the other cities, I can see the King's Landing and Winterfell. There's no node in between. So like this is only one level apart, but the cumulative distance is um, yeah, it's long because Winterfell is so much in the north compared to King's Landing. I'm going to uh, like Bravos is a long distance. I have to hop many other nodes or to Cohort is even longer. And this is a similar distance. So this is almost double as far away as Winterfell is from King's Landing. So we can also find out something about our graphs. So graphs could be undirected or directed. I have a question to you. So please be nice to me and answer in the chat is which one of those two is the undirected graph? Is it the left one with Winterfell or is it the right one with Rob, which one is undirected? Probably everybody got it right. The left one is the undirected. We can see there's no arrows in between. Um, there are no errors in between. So that means that, yeah, this is undirected. We can go both ways. We can go from Winterfell to Castle Serwin, but also the other way around. But Rob and Edward and Kathleen, this is a directed graph because Robert, Rob is the son of Edward. Rob is the son of Kathleen. We cannot turn this around. This is a directed graph. And here I came up with some queries how we can find out if something is directed or not directed. So what I'm checking here is, I'm checking the way from one table to the other one and then checking if I can go back again. So I'm going from the family to another node in the family and then I have a left join because there's no guarantee is there a way back or not. That's why I'm left joining it. And if I can find the B, if this is null, uh, then I say yes. This is um, directed. Um, if this is null, so if I cannot find the way back, then I state this is directed. Uh, if I can find the way back, then I state this is undirected. And we know that most, um, again, like in the beginning, like uh, Edward to his children. Of course, this is a directed graph. Edward is the father of his children, but the children are not uh, the father of them. So there's no way back. We do the same for the points of interest. So most of them should be undirected or, or 
yeah, it's not the, the undirected because I can always go from Ashmark to Golden Tooth, and I can also go from Golden Tooth to Ashmark. So I'm sure we can also find this in this list. So there's always both ways, and of course this is then an undirected path. Then we can have cycles in some of the graphs, and my question to you is again, which one is the R cycle graph? The left one or the right one? And I'm sure most of you, all of you got it right. So the right one is the acyclic graph. Hierarchies are always acyclic. So there's only one way from one node to the others. And if it's an uh, undirected graph, there's always only one way I can connect those uh, nodes with each other. But in real graphs, I would say, like point of interest, the cheapest system, system has always worked with cycles. That means that the algorithms are a little bit more complicated as we have to account for not going backwards and going in cycles because then our loops, our common expression would never end. It would never um, yeah, um, find a solution there. So how can we find if there are cycles or not? Um, I'm finding out if there's a, if the subgraph, so if like going from one node to the other node, if the subgraph is uh, cyclic or is not cyclic. And I'm what I'm using here, I'm finding path and looking for path which start and end at the same node. So if I can go like two other nodes and then coming back to my own node, this means that this there's an at least a cycle in, 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 this, in this portion of the graph. Doesn't mean that the whole graph is cyclic, but at least this portion is cyclic. And this is what we can use here. So I'm looking for the shortest path from A to B and checking then if A and B could be equal. So this means that there's a cycle possible. And if I go for my points of interest, this algorithm takes, a, a, I think it's 10 seconds now, it's not 30 seconds anymore. So something got faster on my machine. At least this last time I you, um, tried this out. So we can see like all the subgraphs from my point of interest, they are cyclic because I always can go from, oh, most of them are cyclic. So I think I, I have some, some nodes there which are only connected with each other, not connected to the rest. I consider this is an error and fault when I typed in the things, but I never discovered before I played around with this kind of, of algorithms. So unconnected graph, that's what I just mentioned, that like there is this part of the graph which is not connected with the rest of the graph. Again, my question is what is the unconnected graph in this picture? Maybe you can type in in the chat window so I can see if you pay attention or could understand what I was explaining. And I assume everybody knows the left one is the unconnected because we have mode Kaling in this example is not connected to the rest of the graph. In a hierarchy typically, at least for the sub part, the, the, the hierarchy itself, there's never an unconnected thing because yeah, if I have a, have a hierarchy, that would mean that it's not part of this hierarchy for organizational uh, charts, for example, that would mean that this is part of a different organization. And then we could discuss, is it like, part of the whole graph or is it not part of the whole graph? Is it just two different graphs? So we can find about if something is connected or not. Um, if the number of possible paths from one, from every node is equal to the number of the nodes minus one. So I'm counting the number of nodes and I'm counting how many paths do I have going from one point to the other, to the other nodes. And if I cannot reach some of the nodes. That means that at least those are nodes or my actual node is unconnected from the other ones. This is how I'm counting this. So I'm counting the amount of nodes. Counting means that I'm counting what, what number of paths did I find and how many nodes do I have in my point of interest table. And this would be theoretically the max number of paths because if everything is connected then I can go from one node to all, to all the other nodes. And that would mean that the node is connected to all the other nodes. If this is not the case, then we have an unconnected graph. And this is what I found out with this query. If I execute this one, again, should take about 10 seconds or 11, 7, 8, 9. 
and there is it. So we can see like uh, Ashmark is connected to most of the of the other nodes from Ashmark. I can go to 78 other nodes. Uh, the same is true for Estopor and so on. But I discovered through this query that I forgot to connect Bloody Gate um, and the URI. Those are connected, but they're not connected with uh, everything else. So apparently this was not by intention and I found out via this kind of, of things. So this could also be interesting in your graphs. Is if you expect that everything is connected, do you have some errors there in the graphs, in the data? So this, this algorithm or this query could help you there. Then we have unweighted graphs. So again, the question is, what is the unweighted graph? I think this is rather easy because the weights are numbers on the edges. And of course, the unweighted is the right graph, not the left one. Um, the left one is weighted. We have numbers there. This could be like miles or hours or costs. If it's like a, a toll road, you could sum up those weights and finding then a, a route which has the lowest number of time, the lowest uh, uh, costs or the lowest miles. Hierarchies for the most part are unweighted because it would be rather weird if I would say I have two children and then I have like, I love more children. I love one children more than the other one. This would be really weird. That would kind of be a weight, for example. So how can we find out if there's a, um, yeah, there's the bloody gate. We talked about that. And then we have the weights. Here I use the metadata. So I use the sys tables, then the sys columns, and then the sys types for all tables, which are edges. So the is edge attribute is available since 2017, where I can mark tables or create tables as edges or nodes. And this way I using the meta table, finding out is there an edge, edge which has um, where the graph type is null and which has a precision unequal to zero. That means it's a numeric one. And I want to exclude the binary, the bit, because yeah, true or false, this would not be a weight, but all the others like uh, integer or floating points would be weighted. So I, you see the metadata and found out that in my example, I have my routes, those are weighted. I have miles by land, water and in total, and I have a recipe uh, database, which has of course an amount. So if I need flour or salt or whatever, then I have an amount there. So this is also a weighted graph but not the family tree. I don't, don't, don't have any weights there. And finally, before we end, yeah, just about an hour. Uh, so degree of node, what is the degree of node? Maybe if you ever heard about that, you already know. So if you ask you, what is the degree of Winterfell? Does anybody know about that? So what is the degree of Winterfell? If you can add this or write this in the chat window. The degree of Winterfell would be two because the degree of a node is how many edges are going out or in to the node. Castle Sovereign has a degree of three because Castle Sovereign is connected to Winterfell, White Harbor and Mold Kaling in this example we see on the screen. And the degree of node is very uh, interesting because it shows the importance of a node. We can calculate that the centrality or also the page rank algorithms is an algorithm which is built on the degree of nodes what is more important, which page, which web page, for example, is more important. It's more important uh, if many other pages point to it. And it's even more important if those other pages are also more important. And there's different definitions of this uh, degree. And I have different versions of this algorithm here. So for example, the centrality is the number of connections, degree centrality. So I'm counting how many are going out, how many coming in. And of course I can then add this up and I can calculate an, an average over those counts. So I found out is some node more important than the other ones in my table. So for example, King's Landing, Storms and, uh, and Winterfell are more, more important in my graph, in my table, because they have a degree of 98, they have 49 outgoing, 49 incoming, as this is an undirected graph, of course, the outcoming and outgoing and incoming is always the same, but on average, we only have 16. So this looks like the, the are more, this, those are more important than the other ones. We could define importantly also with the closeness centrality, which means that 
the nodes with the shortest path to all other nodes. That would mean that it's very close to everything else, which also means a kind of centrality. Um, and this is called closeness centrality. So I'm calculating um, the miles, how, much, uh, how, how, um, how many miles is something away, and then divide one by this, this, uh, this mile. So I get like, turn it around, because I'm looking for not many miles, for um, closeness. So we can see, for example, Bloody Gate and the Erie are very have a, 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 a high closeness because they only have two nodes. This is a micro uh, graph, a uh, subgraph only connecting those two. And the other ones, very interesting, Mir is rather away from everything else, but compared to the others, it has a high closeness because it's more in the middle of the map of the known world we have in, in, um, in, in the uh, Game of Thrones books and TV show. You can also calculate the betweenness centrality. This means what uh, the number of shortest paths which walk through this node. So this is important, for example, for networks. Think of IoT, Internet of Things. So if some of those nodes are fa failing, this is really bad for the whole structure because so many other nodes are having their shortest path through them. Or think about routes with your car. So if like, um, this is the shortest route and then there's an accident there. This means that everybody else has to go a, a longer way because they have to avoid this, uh, this part of, of, the, of the street network because this is closed down currently. And this, how, how can we uh, calculate this? I'm uh, calculating the, um, the counts and finding then the maximum counts of uh, how many nodes are going through. So, I'm looking for uh, the, the path. So I pre um, I also already materialized the, the path, and then I uh, split this path by um, yeah by my little arrow. So I get then a list of how this path is connected to the uh, how this node is connected to the uh, to the other nodes, and counting how many are there and how often. This, the node I'm interested in, the point of interest name, is mentioned in all the other paths. So if we execute this, then we find out that, for example, we have different between these uh, centralities, for example, 4840 would be the highest one. Um, and I'm not sure why I didn't I sort here. Let's order, order by, um, this is three, not three, two. So then we get like, yeah, and we should or the other way around uh, descending. So we get like the most important on top. And again, King's Landing is very important because many of the roads go through King's Landing. That's the capital in this universe. Um, it's not, not a surprise, but again, did this probably biased because I just chose uh, 180 points of interest, um, which I thought would be interesting in my database. We can also, um, yeah, the pivotal, that means that um, a pivotal path would be, a node would be one where all the other paths are going to this node. So this is a really, really important like hub in the network. So we can could find out about that. And I think at the end, what uh, do I have here? Yeah, you can also then find out how, how you can avoid this if it's blocked. This is what your network structure has to do or what, what, what your GPS does if you ask, hey, there's an accident. Uh, can we please find a way around for the next, I don't know, five kilometers or 20 miles or whatever um, the structure of this um, accident is. Then there's also the between a centrality where I identify, identify the control, the control points. So let's execute this one. And at the end we have the page rank. So for mode killing, for example, if I go from mode killing to storm's end, then the path in between a castle server in King's Landing and Winterfell. And if somebody something is blocked there, I cannot go from what Kaling to Storm's End. That's the bottom end of, of this algorithm. So I also can find out what are my 
ja, what are the important points of going from A to B? Um, when do I get in trouble if I um, if something like this is, is blocked? And the page rank, very uh, famous algorithm. I mean, I think uh, Google Google's uh, search uh, search algorithm was based on the page rank algorithm. I don't think it's anymore so important, but still the the most important is an um, implementation of that here. And as I mentioned, this is like counting how many other nodes are pointing to the point I'm uh, I'm currently evaluating. And the importance is not only the number, but also like how important the other nodes are. So this algorithm is going in circles by intention and executing many rounds because first round only finds out in the first round what is the important, but it's not, does not uh, take into account that the other uh, nodes pointing to my could also be important. So I have to do this uh, several rounds for that. Um, and that's how I find it out. And I think that, um, uh, not I think, but I know it's only coming up with a number between zero and nine. So nine would be most important, zero would be not so important. And this is what this algorithm does. And we can, before I run out of time, I can execute this, not the editor, but the results. So for example, I get then my page ranks for, for example, storms and would be more important than King's Landing in this case. So we have like the uh, edge out count is seven and the weight would be then, for example, 0.033 um, for storms and, which is slightly more important than King's Landing in terms of how, uh, what kind of, of other nodes are surrounding uh, storms and and uh, making possible to go to storms and. But of course, King's Landing with a fail is also rather important. Should no, not be any surprise. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, good hour um, about um, hierarchies and graphs. So I we started more easy part self-joining tables, which we can query in loops and with a recursive commutable expression. That I did show you the cipher query language, and at the end we had. Uh, the advanced things like transitive closure, shortest path, and then measures around graph uh, structures where you can find out what are important uh, nodes, what are not so important nodes were. Um, yeah. And this can be applied to many, many, many different things. I did show you the, the Stark family tree as a hierarchy, and I used the point of interest in Winter, uh, not in Winterfell, but in Westeros, um, to as an example, but of course you could use your GPS system, you could use uh, internet of things, you could use uh, like social social graphs, how people are connected, what are important people in the graph. There's so many things you can do with graphs if you want know how to create them. So I hope you did learn something. I hope you did now know more about graphs than John Snow does. This is my favorite pie chart, the 100% pie chart, because according, according to Igrid, John Snow knows nothing, so this pie chart shows nothing as 100%. And this leads me to the resources. So uh, we didn't have time to talk about group by and things. There's a really good documentation out there. Many things about the functions and the common type expressions I learned was from Itzik Ben Gan. So please check out his book, TC Greek Wearing, which is a really, really good book. It's a really good educator, Itzik. And from Steve Statman, I learned the possibility that, that we can not only go uh, one um, ID up in the, in the tree in the common type expression, but two, this is how I built the father and the mother uh, royal uh, family tree. And there's also uh, information about graph DB architecture and graph data process processing in SQL Server. Um, so please dig deeper into these topics. There's also a yeah, blameless, uh, shameless plug-in. Uh, as, as you say, then in January 15, we have the SQL Saturday in Austria, a free event and it's remote. So everybody joining this conference can also join our SQL Saturday, which is on a Friday uh, Europe time. So we always do it on a Friday. And yeah, with that said, I'm coming to an end. And then everybody died, the end. So this is uh, um, the author of uh, Game of Thrones sitting there and obviously killing another person. Are there any questions? Then I'm open up for questions. Please contact me or we use the chat window. I will be here. For